It is so good for us to bow before you as we begin this leadership training time here at Cedar Grove. And God, together, we who are in this room, agree together for your blessing on people on the other side of the world who desperately, desperately need resources. And Lord, we ask that you would enable them to have enough internet capability to download it, to watch it, to interpret it, to use it. Lord, bless leaders on the other side of the world from us in seven nations in Southern Africa and in Pakistan, India, and Nepal. Jesus, it is so beautiful that this church right here in the beautiful mountains of central Pennsylvania can invest in the lives of people on the other side of the world. Thank you for that amazing honor, Lord. God, today, in Jesus' name, I pray for your anointing on the atmosphere as we look at leadership development. And I ask in Jesus' name for your anointing on my heart so that I can say what needs to be said and leave unsaid things that shouldn't. Lord, Set the atmosphere of this room on fire with your love and speak to us today. Speak to us deeply today. And I pray, God, for those who might are, are sensing a call to some form of spiritual leadership. Jesus, make it clear. And send people in their, into their lives who can affirm and encourage and bless them as budding young leaders. I pray all these things in the sweet and holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Now as I begin this morning, I want to just uh, make a couple of comments and then I'm going to take right off in the, in the lesson today. Um, you, you're going to get a, you're, if you don't have one, you're going to get an, an outline should be coming to you shortly. All you need is a pen. So Get your pen kick started. Hopefully you have a Bible or a Bible app on your phone and you can get rolling with me now. Um, the reason I believe so strongly in leadership development as a man in my 70th year, I believe so strongly in leadership development because people took the time to invest in me when I was really, really young and really, really raw in my journey. When I got saved, I got saved out of the drug and alcohol culture. And I had some people who invested in me. Raina and I had the blessing of having godly grandparents who loved us and accepted us and encouraged us in our journey. And I don't know where I'd be without, without my grandparents or Raina's grandparents. I, I don't know where I'd be without people who were spiritual fathers to me and spiritual mothers to Raina. Raina had some wonderful women who sewed into her life. And uh, we're just grateful, so deeply grateful for that. Raina, Raina had Janet Beeson who would come and visit her and sew into her life as a young mother, she had, she had two little ones when she was called to be a pastor's wife. And she had two little ones. And she said her life changed immediately from Sunday night to Monday morning. Because now she was Pastor Kenny's wife. Please don't call me Kenny. <laughs> Pastor Kenny's wife. Um, do you understand what I'm, what I'm saying to you? P people invested in us. And we were better for it. My Uncle Sam invested in us. Ken Beeson in me. Pastor Gene Heidler invested so much in me. I had a professor at Messiah College, Dr. Owen Alderfer, who invested in me. Uh, honestly, I was walking in things that were buckling my knees. And I needed somebody to just listen and speak encouragement into my life or I may have quit. Honestly, I may have quit in my first couple of years in ministry because my knees buckled. What I'm saying is, if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, please find some people that you can invest in. 
I'm pleading with you. Find some people that you can invest in. And if you have young people in your life, be their biggest cheerleader. Are you hearing me? If you are over 50, you should be one of the biggest cheerleaders in the history of this planet to young people that you think are being called into the ministry. Are you good? Okay, I need to get rolling or we're not going to get through the lesson. Here we go. The concept of spiritual leadership is um, something we're going to, we're going to, each of these leadership lessons, we're going to look at an overarching scripture, and that overarching scripture is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. If you can see the screen behind me, read with me, please. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Here's my presupposition. The next generation of spiritual leaders will not evolve from good intentions. They won't evolve, they, they won't evolve from us being a really great church that preaches the Bible. The next generation of spiritual leaders are in our nurseries and Sunday school rooms and probably in some of our families. And they don't even know it yet. And it takes work to be a godly spiritual leader. It takes work to identify and bless and invest in young lives. This isn't easy, and it's really, really important that you get this. There, there, are, there are budding leaders waiting in the wings in every church. They just have to be found, identified, and empowered. Really, really important. That's why I'm so grateful to have all these young lives looking at me right now. Here are your first set of legs. Leaders must be found. <coughs> They must be identified, they must be invested in, and then they must be released to do ministry with us while we're doing ministry. We need to walk with them. And I promise you, new leaders are going to make a mistake or two. And somebody has to be there to help them pick up the pieces. Look, I, I've been doing this, um, because it was done for me, I've been doing this since I first became a senior pastor at the age of 31. And I got thrown into the deep end of the pool when I was 31 years old. And some of you are thinking, that's, I'm, I'm old, that, that's old, I'm nowhere near 31 yet. The rest are thinking, that's just a whippersnapper. But when I was 31, they made me senior pastor at the Mechanicsburg Brethren in Christ Church. And I got thrown into the deep end of the pool. And my knees buckled. I mean, I just didn't know what was coming. Thank God. <laughs> my wife just said, thank God. <laughs> so, but, but what, what I believed about what was done for me I invested there. And when we left there, 17 years later, their entire staff were lay people when we got there. Dr. Lane Lebo, the senior pastor there, has been their senior pastor for 23 years and a pastor there for 27 years now. And he was, in, he was a junior in high school when I went to McVick. You get, you get what I'm saying? Investment and release. People need to be invested in. So when, when we look at spiritual leaders, um, if we're going to invest in them, they, first of all, have to have received the kingdom of Jesus in their hearts. You're, you're not going to be able to invest something in them they haven't come to know in a personal way. If we're to empower others to lead and exert influence in the kingdom of God, they have to be in the kingdom. So you can train 
somebody who doesn't really know the Lord Jesus well till you're blue in their face and it's not going to change anything. So what I want to start with this morning is our own call as spiritual leaders. And um, you, might, you might be sitting here thinking, well, I'm just a kid. I, I don't know that I'm called yet. Well, if you're, if you're sensing the Lord wants to use me, I'm talking to you. If you're sensing that, I'm talking to you. Because that's how the Lord begins this. I mean, he doesn't, he, when, he, when he found me, he didn't find a, full, a fully formed spiritual leader. He got some awfully rough material. Phil Varner's sitting back there laughing at me right now. He remembers the rough material. Hair out to here, you know, the whole nine yards. I remember him. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing I want to say about this call and this anointing, um, we're, we're going to begin with our own spiritual lives. I promise you... The enemy is going to whisper to you, who do you think you are? I promise you. That's what he does. It is called condemnation. Look, you know you have areas in your life that you're not as mature as you want to be. So does everyone else in the room. <laughs> I, I meant that to be funny. Only one person laughed out loud. Thank you, Ashley. If, if you're a spirit-led person, you're going to hear, who do you think you are to help someone else? Amen. You just are. So it's really, really important that you, that you get this sense that this is something that I just feel God tugging me to do. And if you're in your teen years... I'm so proud of you that God, you, know, you sense God wants to do something in you and with you and through you. That just, boy, that fires this old man up. I just need you to know that with all my heart. So the, in reality, integrity of heart doesn't begin with perfection. Integrity of heart begins when we tell God honestly in prayer, God, I don't think I have what it takes, but Jesus, I believe you're speaking to me, and I want to honor you. So I just want to bless that with every fiber of my being. In relation to the prospective leaders that we're going to see grow here at Cedar Grove, they're not going to be fully mature. If they were fully mature, they wouldn't need you. So, if you see people that you just, I, I, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around people seeing me and speaking blessing into my life when I was so young in the Lord. I was two and a half years old in Christ when the Lord began to call me into spiritual leadership. I, got, I was not quite 23 when I got saved. You hearing me? And I was less than two and a half years old when I started to feel this tug to preach the gospel. And it kind of, at, at first, it freaked me out. Right? I'll be straight up with you. I, I wasn't at all happy about this. Um, I am a loner by nature and an introvert by nature. And getting in front of people wasn't exactly something that I was ready to sign up for right away. It took a while. It took me a while to be willing to get on with this. So... The, the, there, there, there are some questions I want to ask you to look for in the lives of people you're going to invest in. First, do you see the seed form of heart issues growing in them where you actually see they, they, they look to you like they're a person who wants to learn and wants to seek God? Do you see that in seed form? I was far, far from anywhere near. A, the first time we did a Bible study in our home, my Uncle Sam said, open to the book of Romans. And I laughed at him because I didn't know there was one, let alone where to find it. So 
I thought, I thought he was joking. You know, open to the book of Romans. I mean, I'm old the Bible, Uncle Sam. What are you talking about? <coughs> I'm, I'm just telling you, how people invested in me when I didn't have much in terms of spiritual understanding. Um, do you see the beginning stages of character developing in the person? Do you see a desire to seek God in the person? If so, that needs to be fanned into flame. Do you see the beginning of the fruit of Jesus' presence in their lives? If so, encourage that to the hilt. You with me? So we have three principles we're starting with. Principle number one. In the kingdom, being comes before doing. The calling to spiritual leadership is first and foremost life-based. So in the kingdom, being a child of God comes before doing a bunch of activities. Always, 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 it's life-based. As we sow seeds of grace and mercy in the lives of people, it is really, really important that they get it what we're seeking to do for them. I have my Bible open to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and just listen to all the times Paul says when you're looking for prospective leaders, this is what you look for. Listen carefully to all the words be. If anyone aspires to the office of, a, of an overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, etc. Verse 4, he must be able to manage his own household. On down, he says, deacons must be dignified, not double-tongued. They must be able to hold on to the mystery of the faith, and their wives must be the same. And he says it, the deacon must be the husband of one wife. So we're going to read together from Titus chapter 1, verses 7 and 9. And the emphases are mine, but I'm trying to emphasize being comes before doing. Let's read together. For but an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction as to sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Principle number one, leadership development principle number one, being comes before doing. So many people get that backwards. They do, and then it crashes and burns in terms of character. That's why leaders fall in sexual immorality and in money issues. It's an amen point. Amen. Being comes before doing. Principle number two, basic leadership. The leadership law of sowing and reaping. This is a fundamental law governing all spiritual relationships, all your relationships, for that matter. My relationship as a husband, my relationship as a father, my relationship as a father-in-law, my relationship with my grandkids, my relationship with you, my church family. The law of sowing and reaping. As you and I sow seeds in the lives of other people, we should expect to reap a harvest. And I've decided that I am not going to be a man who sows seeds of negative criticism. I can see what's wrong with people's lives just as well as anybody else. But that doesn't mean I have the right to speak into it. I'm, I've decided if I'm going to err on anything in the law of sowing and reaping, I'm going to err on the side of grace and side of grace and mercy, not judgment. So if you t come and talk to me about some failures in your life or something you're struggling with, I promise you, 
My first response is not going to be judging you. I promise you, my first response is going to be, how can I help? I love you. You're important to me. I'm going to throw all kinds of grace on you. Are you good? Okay, all three of you, stay with me. Let's read together. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to the family of believers. You simply must understand this spiritual law. The Lord speaks to it again and again and again. What you sow, you reap. Listen to what Hosea says. Hosea 10, verses 12 and 13. Listen to this. Sow for yourselves righteousness... Reap the fruit of unfailing love. Break up the unplowed ground of your heart, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. But you have planted wickedness, and you have reaped evil. Mm. The law of sowing and reaping. I, I've decided that I want to be a man who meets with Jesus on a regular, faithful basis. Because I want to have things to sow in the lives of people that the Lord has sown in me. So I get myself out of bed at an unearthly hour in the morning. And I get alone with my Kenyan cup of coffee and my Bible. And I get after it. Because I want to hear the Lord each new day. Out of increasing intimacy with God, you have something to share with people. Out of increasing measures of listening to the Holy Spirit. Uh, here's, here's the bottom line for all spiritual leadership. It takes a godly leader to identify and invest in another godly leader. So you need to get after it in your own personal journey with the Lord. Principle number three. And this is very much like the, the last principle. The law of, of leadership investment. The leadership law of investment. It's definitely true that we only have one life. And I really am learning all about that one these days. In my 70th year on the planet, I only have one life. And I want to use it the very, very best I can. So I listened to my sweet girlfriend of almost 49 years, 48 of them married, when she told me, it's time for you to start teaching on leadership before you are too old to get up there. <laughs> she didn't quite say it that way. But... <laughs> yes, yeah, she did. Yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> so there are two ways to live your life. You can invest it or you can spend it. It's up to you. Right? Two ways to live your life. You can spend it. Or you can invest it. And I've decided that I want to do everything I can to help people. I want to invest in people with every fiber of my being. As you think about the concept of leadership development... It's important that you and I give ourselves to processes that are intentional. If you're, if you're walking around this church on a Sunday morning, look, you can talk to your friends. And you can say about what a wonderful week you had or the things you want to do this week. Or you can walk around this church and look at young people and speak something into their lives that will be a blessing to them. You decide. You can spend your life, or you can invest your life. I'm pleading with you to invest it. You young'uns, you, you, you guys that are in your teen years and in your 20s, 
I'm pleading with you, look for people that you can encourage along the way. Some of you are going to have friends that don't even know Jesus yet. Encourage them. Invest in them. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about what the Lord's doing in your life. You can spend your life, or you can invest your life. Investment pays dividends in other lives far more than it does your own. I cannot overstate that. That is just so vital. I once did a weekend retreat. I prefer to call them advances because I don't think you retreat when you're leaders. So I, I prefer to call them leaders advances. I once did one for a, a whole, it was a whole room full of Christian teachers. And I really, really frustrated those folks because I told them the entire weekend, I kept saying to them the whole weekend, find the sweet children in your classroom that you see leadership in and invest in those children. And some of them were really offended at that because they have to invest in all their children. Okay, I get that. But you're with them more than their parents are. Because when they're with their parents, they're sitting there looking at their phone. So you have them seven hours a day. You can see the seeds of greatness in a child. Encourage it. Are you good? When you're with your grandchildren, oh man, don't let them sit there with their face in their phone. Encourage them. Speak into their lives the principle of investment. You can spend your life or you can, you can invest your life. And here, here's this quote I was giving you earlier. It takes a godly leader to know a godly leader. So this morning, I promised you we were going to talk about character. We are going to talk about character. So let's think through the present generation of spiritual leaders. How do they walk through life and what do they look for in the lives of people that they're going to invest in? And I want to give you a few things that are just seed thoughts. These aren't well developed. These are th seed thoughts. And each, actually, each one of the things I'm doing in this pilot lesson, we will flesh out for an entire lesson in the coming months. Does everybody understand me? These are just, this is a pilot lesson. And we're going to really tear into some of these things and drill down into them as we continue over the next number of months on those four Tuesday evenings and on the YouTube channel. So here we go. If you're going to invest in the lives of people, it's important on the front end of this discussion to understand that some people you invest in are going to flourish and other people you invest in are going to crash and burn. And the difference between the two, between Flourishing and growing and crashing and burning is the issue of character development. More and more leaders are leaving the ministry all the time, here and on the other side of the world, because they did not create the framework of character development. They just did not. So these are seed things you're looking for in your own life, and in the lives of, of others. The first one is integrity. We're going to do an entire night on integrity. But for, for right now, integrity is to be on the inside what you say you are. Sorry, say, I said it backwards. It is to be on the outside what you say you are on the inside. In nautical terms, a ship is said to have integrity if it can stay afloat. And in spiritual terms, a Christian can stay afloat in the storms of life if their character is integ has integrity. I'm just going to breeze through these so I can save some time for Q&A at the end. The second one is honesty. One of my favorite scriptures about honesty is Ephesians 4, 16. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. Honesty. 
Um, I am not talking about being blunt and unkind. I said speaking the truth in love. If you are a person who is prone to setting people straight, you know, like Sam the bald eagle on the Muppet Show, just you might want to just cool your jets and not talk to people. Because I, I, I say this a lot. If it doesn't hurt you to have to hurt someone else, you're not in a position to do it yet. Because it should hurt you. <clears throat> there are too many people who have fruit inspector badges in the church in North America. And i got to be honest with you, I have yet to see in the scripture a fruit inspector badge. I haven't found it anywhere in the Bible. Honesty, speaking the truth in love. Here's, here's one. This one, you're going to really love this one. A person who is loyal. A person who sees tasks through. They start it, they finish it. Being loyal is not siding with someone who's wrong. Well, that's our culture right now. I could just, my teeth want to blow up. When I hear, you know, when, when I hear some of the stuff that passes for truth talking, some, I'm not going to use the gender, but th there was actually a person testifying before Congress who said a man can get pregnant this week. Now you talk about truth that's up for grabs. Truth that's fluid and subjective. <coughs> Testifying before Congress. <laughs> I thought my teeth were going to blow up. Good night, folks. Listen, we aren't going to celebrate birthing person day here at Cedar Grove. We're going to celebrate Mother's Day. <coughs> And we're not going to celebrate, I'm not going to dedicate clumps of cell that are breathing. We're going to dedicate babies. I know, that's not politically correct. Okay. Are you, yeah, loyalty, it, it, honesty, it, it's to be on the outside, what we, what we say we are on the inside, it's to, it's to be true to truth, and the truth is in the God's word. So, well, I can't overstate that one either. And another one you're looking for is not people who are so holy they glow in the dark when they take their clothes off at night. You're looking for holiness that's developing. You're looking for people who are starting to take into their lives the presence of Jesus. And you can see them transforming. And holiness, what, here's what I, I try to teach wherever I am here and on the other side of the world. Holiness is when we address our own self-interest and attack it. Because we realize we can't take our self-interest to heaven with us. Holiness isn't, you know, you're so holy you glow in the dark. Holiness is addressing self-interest. And we all got one of those when we were born. If you don't think children have self-interest... I, I, you've heard me say this before. I have an empirical test. If you don't think children have self-interest, take six little girls and one Barbie and Ken and put them in a room <laughs> for 20 minutes. Six girls and one Barbie and Ken doll and put them in a room for 20 minutes. You might want to wash through a window. You might want to have the referee's whistle ready. Because I promise you the sparks are going to fly. Six little boys, one John Deere riding tractor. <laughs> or one Case IH riding tractor for Fred and Sandy. I guarantee you Spark's going to fight. You might want to give them football helmets when you put them in the room with the one tractor. I'll tell you what's going to happen. The baddest cat in the jungle is going to be driving, and the one kid he likes is going to be sitting beside him in the passenger seat. 
and the other four are going to be on the floor pitching a while. <laughs> Self-interest is wired in. Holy Spirit addresses it to take it out. Some scripture about holiness. Let's read. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is my absolute favorite holiness text in the entire Bible. I love this one more than any other holiness text in the whole Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Let's read. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Let me go back here. God has given us some things we might need. What's it say? Everything we need. Our relationship with Jesus gives us everything we need for a life of godliness. You've heard me say this before. Jesus plus anything is heresy. Jesus plus anything is heresy. Second major principle, the framework of a positive attitude. Again, each one of these will be their own lessons in the future. We're going to drill down on all these so you have things to teach, and so you have things to invest in the lives of people in your own journey. First and foremost, this vital issue is you, you, these are attitudes you want to fan into flame in your own life, and these are things you want to fan into flame with the young people that you are investing in. The Lord, the Lord has gone on record of telling us exactly what he delights in. I know a guy who wrote a book called A Heart for His Delights. And it has an, it's an entire book. It's, I, I think it's one of the best books I've ever written. Just kidding. <laughs> It's easily one of the best three books I've ever written. Um, it, it's, an, it's, an app, it's a book about the attitudes we can embrace that God says he cherishes or delights in. And here they come. You ready? The first one is humble and broken. Genuine humility is to know yourself strong. Genuine brokenness is is something God looks for in every person he uses. And if, if that person he's called isn't broken yet, he will break us. I promise you, I was not nearly as broken when I started as I am now of my ability to do stuff for me and others. God will break us. It's called the school of hard knocks or the school of God. You show me the hero, I'll show you the desert. Name them. Every hero in the Bible spent some time in the desert. Why? Breaking. Even Jesus, 40 days. Where? In the desert. This is amazing stuff. I mean, God looks for brokenness. And if he doesn't see enough of it, he'll ensure that he does. I cannot overstate this one. This is a big one. A heart that's humble and a heart that's broken. Second thing God's looking for. Soft and teachable. I'm going to just do a parenthesis here for the people in the room with me here. And the people on the other side of the world will be using this. I want to do a parenthesis here. This isn't in your notes, but it is in mine. I have had more than my share of conversations where a person comes up to me and asks me a question that sets me up because they want to tell me about their hobby horse.
I don't like being set up, do you? <laughs> That's not my favorite thing. And I come away from those conversations doing my very best to keep my teeth in my mouth. Because it is just, it is hard for me. I've been, I've been around so many people, oh yeah, I know all about that. I know all about that. My sweetheart was once investing in a young person, a young woman, that we sensed God was calling into the ministry. When my sweetheart tried to tell that young woman about the ministry, the young woman told my wife about what it meant to be a pastor's wife. Very helpful for Raina to get that flow of information from a 21-year-old. Very helpful. She came, you came away edified, right, dear? I mean, just totally edified. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm throwing down here? This is, a, this is huge. Soft and teachable. Please, please don't set people up. Please don't do that to people. If you don't like it, don't do it. And I don't like it. I don't like being set up. The third one. The desire to know Jesus more intimately than I presently do. One thing I can tell you, uh, I'm in my, whatever year it is, 1975 to 2022, whatever that is, 47th year of walking with Jesus. In my 47th year of walking with Jesus, I know him a whole lot more intimately now than I did when I met him at first. And I don't know him as intimately as I want to. And there are people who are older than me in the room, Rena, Phil, Dick Crawford, are older than me in the room. I'll, if you ask them that question after the class is over, I'm, I'm telling you, they're gonna say, I wanna know Jesus more intimately in my journey. I know them well enough to know that about them. They're on a journey too. So I want to I want to just I'm just going to park here for a minute. I wrote this slide um, and I bolded it and I highlighted it because I want to say this with every fiber of my being. You and I choose our desires and we choose what our emotions are feeling. Emotions are not in control of us. Desires are not in control of us. Our culture is wrong. Our culture is saying you, you go with how you feel at any given moment. And, if, and so what's right for me not, might not be right for you. And what's right for you might not be right for me. Emotions are terrible masters and better slaves. So please hear me. I'm trying to be helpful with every fiber of my being. Desires, you and I choose the desires that we will fan into flame. And we choose the desires that we will start. The desires we fan into flame will grow and the desires we starve will die. I just cannot overstate that one. Um, you've heard me say this before. I am, I am deeply passionate in my love for my wife, Raina. Just not right now. Nobody in this room wants to see a PDA from Pastor Ken and Raina Hefner, right? public display of affection, not a protection from abuse order. You getting this? You getting this? Please, I'm, I'm hoping you're getting, you're get, you do not, you are not at the mercy of your desires. Your desires follow your will, not vice versa. Framework of positive actions. Framework of positive actions. Again, these are all in seed form. Um, I'm, I'm just going to give these to you as quickly as I can because we're going to come back to each one of these uh, over the next year or two as we do these monthly leadership um, advancement, leadership development evenings. It's imperative to Christian leaders that we make 
quality, godly decisions based on what we truly believe. Actions should be founded in what we believe the scriptures say, not what they say to me, what they say. I'm done with the, well, the Bible says this to me. No, the Bible is true, period. Whether you like it or not, whether it speaks to you or not, the scriptures are the inspired word of God and are profitable for instruction in righteousness, period. So there you go. Big fat Greek wedding. There you go. First, deeply committed. And in our nation, this is one of their, our best things that our culture does. We are totally committed to the right thing. Or maybe not. Commitment is a huge word in the family of God. Deeply, deeply committed. Commitment means you see it through. You start it and you do it. And to me, commitment is enormous in my journey with Jesus. And I'm hoping it's enormous for you in your journey with Jesus. Second is discipline. And when I use the word discipline, I'm talking about two things. First, I'm talking about disciplining yourself to get alone with God. But I'm also talking about disciplining yourself to do the right things for your health. I'm, I'm talking about getting exercise. I'm talking about eating the right kinds of things. The older I get, the more I find that it's way easier to put it on than it is to take it off. Before I was 40 years old, I could eat anything. I mean, I could eat like a horse. And I'm not talking about, hey, I'm talking like five sandwiches. I have grandsons who will eat five or six of Pappy Hefner's famous Sloppy Joe's. You'll just sit and eat five or six of them. I have, if I did that right now, I would look rather gigundo normo around the middle. And I'm trying to go the other way, not up. So discipline, it's not an ugly word. Personal discipline with Jesus, alone with Scripture, time talking to him and you know I'm, I'm telling you for me my prayer life is a prayer journal and if you ever come see me in my study I can point you to only 12 years of my prayer journaling I have another 20 something years in my one filing cabinet drawer so I've been prayer journaling for a long time and the reason is I'm easily distracted squirrel I'm, I'm easily <laughs> distracted and so for me for me, I, you know, I, I have to write to the Lord if I'm going to stay on it. You know, I have this beautiful wife who gets up in the morning talking. She gets up in the morning talking. She comes out of the room, good morning, and that's not the end of the conversation. You know, she's, she's just, and I cherish her. Please don't hear me demeaning her. I cherish her deeply. And she can talk as much as she wants, but I get up at five. So I don't have to listen to anybody talk but Jesus. <laughs> so here's one that, you, oh, this one is so much fun. Willing to work. Willing to, this one is such fun. Willing to work. Look, if you want to help leaders in the family of God, to grow, you need to tell them on the front end, it doesn't stop at the end of a 35 hour work week. There are gonna be two o'clock in the morning calls when you only have seven brain cells on and none of them are touching. <laughs> Pastor, somebody just died, we need you to come now, please. You're gonna get that. So leaders must be willing to work. Cannot overstate this one. This is, this is just gigundo enormous. So we're going to land the plane. I've talked way too many illustrations this morning. This should be Roman numeral four. I don't know who wrote this, but whoever it was didn't write the right Roman numeral. Should be Roman numeral four. When no positive framework exists. And now I'm going to give you some things to look for that you're not going to like in your own journey. And... 
you shouldn't like when you see them in the prospective leaders' lives. So I'm going to give you just a few bewares as we conclude this morning. I meant to leave more time for Q&A. I'm looking like a bit very good. So here we go. Um, honestly, anointing remains in a container that's prepared for it, and anointing doesn't remain in a container that is not prepared for it. So if God is going to use us, we have to create a place in our own journey where God can speak to us, touch us, influence us, and minister to us. We have to create that. That's your job. My job. That's why I get alone with the Lord in the morning. I want to have a place for the anointing to dwell. I call it my clay jar, and mine's cracked. I am a cracked pot. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 11. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the ultra passing power is from God, not from my pot is cracked, and I know it. My last book I ever write is going to be the Confessions of a Cracked Pot, and I'm, I'm going to write all the crazy things that people told me when I was in ministry. Like, I had a gentleman who struggled with the English language. I walked into his hospital room and he said, Pastor, the doctor give me the long face. He says, I have suggestive heart failure. <laughs> Stuff like that, I think, is just absolutely hilarious. It's going to be the confessions of a cracked pot, and it's going to just be one craziness after another. So here are some things that you'll want to watch out for when you see them coming at you. And young people, remember I said I'm not talking to you? When we read this, I'm not talking to you, young people. Here we go. Ready? Let's read. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment of the devil. They must first be tested, and if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, and do not partake in the sins of others, the sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not cannot be hidden. So, let me just give you, in closing, a few bewares. Here we go. This is going to be so much fun. Beware of people who see themselves as being a great spiritual leader. I was once talking with a professional baseball scout at a local baseball field. And I said, who are you here to see? And he said, blankety blank, blank, blank. And I said, well, what are you thinking? He said, this is a quote from the professional baseball scout. I'm not interested. He thinks he's as good as he's going to get. Are you hearing me? Beware of people who see themselves as a great spiritual leader. Beware of people who come on strong quickly and want a lot of your time because they see themselves as being your partner in ministry. Beware. You want people who are, who are coming into the yoke of spiritual leadership, kicking and screaming all along the way. Not those who are like, yep. You, you good? Beware of people whose MO is negative criticism. I have scoured the four texts on the, on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4. And I have yet to find the gift of negative criticism. <laughs> Beware of people who come across with negative criticism. And here I'm, I'm going to give you another disclaimer. 
Beware of people who are critical who've never built anything. Beware of people who are critical who don't encourage. Beware of people who are critical but never build up. Beware. Because it's only a matter of time until you mess up and they're coming for you, Jack. Beware of people who go to great lengths to seem too good to be true because they are. <laughs> That's supposed to be funny. <laughs> Beware of people who go to great lengths to seem too good to be true because they are. Okay, I have to land the plane. Um, for you in this room, every fourth Tuesday um, at 6.30, you're welcome to meet with me here, and I'm going to do my very, very best to flesh out. You're going to need a three-ring binder. You're going to need a Bible or a Bible app and a pen, and come ready to, to share and think and wrestle with me. If you are on the other side of the world, I want you to know just what I said at the beginning, my pastors and bishops. There are seven bishops in Southern Africa, Tariq and the entire staff of the seminary in Lahore, Pakistan, uh, Bishop Dr. Shemlal Hemron, Bishop Dr. B. Joy Roll on the other side of the world. You are welcome to have any of these lessons, translate them into your language, teach them as though you wrote them. I don't care. This is for you. I love you, and I want you to be blessed. So thank you so much for being here this morning and allowing me to speak into your lives. And Garrick, we're praying for you, buddy, that the Lord will use you powerfully and the worship team in second service. Garrick has a wonderful message for those of you who haven't heard it yet. It's straight from the heart of God. Pray with me. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This concept of leadership development is so critical to the future of the Church of Jesus in North America. God, I pray that you will please use this pilot lesson here at Cedar Grove to bless, and I especially want to speak blessing and encouragement in the young minds and hearts that are here, that God's going to use them in wonderful, powerful ways. I, I just, I speak blessing to their journey as they, as they help other people and lead other people and encourage other people. God, bless them. Anoint them and use them. Bless my brothers and sisters who are in their middle years and those of us who are in our senior years that we can be a blessing, Lord. That we can find, identify and bless and invest. Oh God, speak. Please don't let this be a notebook that sits on a shelf. Please, Lord, enable us to flesh it out. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for the honor of speaking into your life. Have an awesome day. Enjoy your worship.